76 hours of brutal close quarters fighting is what awaited the American Marines attacking the tiny island of Bedio and the Tarawa Atoll in the midst of the Gilbert Islands. What was expected to be a quick and easy amphibious assault by the Marines quickly went south when many of the amphibious craft that were used were stuck in low tide on the coral reefs surrounding the island. Under heavy Japanese artillery and arms fire, the embattled Marines were forced to wade hundreds of yards ashore. For the Marines making the assault, it was a rude awakening, and an even ruder awakening for the war effort and the people on the home front. The United States entered the war in 1941 after the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Initially, the tides were wholly in the favor of the Japanese. At the same time as Pearl, they had launched assaults on U.S.-held territories all across the Pacific, shocking the United States and decisively beating them at almost every turn. By mid-1942, the U.S. began to take some victories of their own, first at the Battle of Midway and later at the Battle of Guadalcanal in late 1942 to early 1943 in the South Pacific. Now they turned their attention to a full-blown island-hopping campaign across the Pacific towards the Japanese mainland. First the Marshall Islands, then the Marianas, but before that there was a chain called the Gilbert Islands. To start off the Central Pacific Campaign, the U.S. launched Operation Galvanic to take the Gilbert Islands with a specific focus on Bedio and the Tarawa Atoll. Bedio had been seized by the Japanese in 1941 and was heavily fortified. By November 19, 1943, American ships arrived in the area and air and naval bombardments began in an effort to soften or eliminate the Japanese defenders. This would in the end prove ineffective. The island's commander was Admiral Kiji Shibasaki, and he was prepared for a fight. The two and a half mile long island by half a mile wide had been under Japanese occupation for nearly two years and it showed. Around 100 pillboxes, sea walls, extensive trench systems, and an airstrip had been installed. Alongside that, there were coastal guns, anti-aircraft guns, heavy machine guns, and some light tanks. The island was then surrounded by reefs covered in barbed wire that at a low tide could prove devastating. Finally, a garrison of 4,500 Japanese defenders was stationed on Bedio. The opposing American fleet was massive. Battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, and more. Alongside the 8,000 Marines that made up the invading force. The morning of November 20th was the set invasion time. Initially, the assault got off on the wrong foot. The seas were turbulent and progress of transferring troops from the carriers to the amphibious vehicles was delayed. A pre-invasion air bombardment was thus also delayed. All during this time, the Japanese had the American ships in the sight of their guns. However, these issues would pale in comparison to the low tides around the island that morning. These low tides exposed the coral reefs that surrounded the island, which were high enough to block some of the amphibious vehicles from getting over them. In the first wave of assault craft, the majority of the smaller vehicles were able to make it to their landing beaches, but the larger craft coming behind were all getting stuck out on the reefs. Despite the best efforts of the Marines to get their crafts back in motion, the majority of Marines on stuck craft would have to jump into the water and wade their way to shore. This was a death trap. Hundreds of yards in some places of open water with virtually no cover for the Marines to wade across before they got to the beach where situations were not much better. Marines covered the beach packed together, crawling forward in the sand. Those coming in had often lost a lot of their equipment on their way, so they were woefully unequipped. The Japanese fire had the troops wading ashore caught in a bloodbath, and those on the beach pinned down. There were around 5,000 Marines that made it to the shore on the first day of fighting, with 1,500 casualties among them, either dead or wounded. The Marines held a beachhead and had made some penetration inland, but their position was precarious as the night fell. The Japanese forces made no major counterattack on their positions that night, but did keep up some sporadic fire. The second day of fighting began with as many issues as the first. Once again, low tides hindered the ability for more arriving troops to safely get to the beaches. Snipers during the night had infiltrated the flanks of the Marines on the island, and were then able to harass them once the morning light offered them views of the sheltering Marines. The majority of the second day, the Marines made attempts to secure their position, both by taking beach areas on the west side of the island to enable reinforcements to come in, and the lines on the initial landing beaches on the north side of the island were still not solid by the end of the second day, but the whole western side of the island had now been secured. The third day of fighting was similar to the second. Now the Marines had a solid foothold on the western side of the island. They just needed to push through east. Reinforcements continued to come in on the western landing site, and those Marines on the original landing sites on the north side of the island were able to link up with the reinforcements. 
fighting was still heavy against the vicious Japanese defense, but by now the tables were solidly turned against the Japanese, and it was only a matter of time before the island fell. The absolute mess of the first day was no more. By the evening, the Japanese forces were now pushed into a tiny pocket in the east portion of the island past the airstrip, and there were still some tiny pockets of defense in other places. The night of the 22nd and early morning of the 23rd would come to serve as a prime example of the Japanese fighting spirit. Late on the 22nd, the remaining Japanese forces began forming up for one final bonsai charge against the American lines on the island. It started with small probing forces, and in the end around 300 Japanese soldiers made one final assault. The American forces fought back with ferocity in the night, and by the morning nearly all of the attacking Japanese were dead. Around 175 Americans were casualties in the night. The battle at this point was over. All of the remaining islands in the atoll were cleared by the 28th with little resistance, but Bloody Betio was secured. The battle was not just important on the front line, it had a huge impact back on the home front. This battle received heavy coverage, mainly due to the heavy casualties inflicted on the Marines. The public could not comprehend how such a tiny island could yield so many problems to the might of the U.S. forces. To add to the issues, the battle received large media coverage, with both actual video footage and photos being taken during the battle to be shown back to the public at home. The public was shocked to see American Marines lying dead on the beaches of this tiny island, and this shock turned to protest. In the end, this amounted to little as the war dragged on, but the battle served as an example to the American people of the sacrifices that would have to be made to secure victory against the enemy. The battle for Tarawa Atoll and Bedio was a massive moment for the American forces in the Pacific. The island hopping campaign finally got underway and many lessons were learned for future invasions. The need for more reconnaissance, better and far more accurate pre-landing bombardments, improved equipment and craft, and more were realized. Also interestingly, the need for underwater demolitions teams was realized. This unit would actually come to be the precursor to the Navy SEALs. In the end, during three days, a thousand Americans died and over 2,000 were wounded. Massive casualty numbers that would continue in the Pacific. Nearly all of the close to 5,000 defenders on the island, both Japanese soldiers and laborers, were killed. This battle was truly a snapshot of what was to come. Hey everybody, how's it going? Cameron, just want to say uh, thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed, like, subscribe, comment, all of that normal stuff. Uh, I've been getting a lot of views on some of our videos recently, and that's really cool to see, and I really appreciate that. And I'm going to keep trying to put out some quality, quality videos as per usual. But yeah, that's enough for me. As always, I will see you on the flip side.